Welcome. My name is Mikko Lievonen. I'm the uh, director of the Kalevi Sorosa Foundation, the think tank based here in Helsinki. Um, the foundation is, is today very pleased to present a lecture by Professor Richard Wilkinson on this topic, equality, well-being and sustainability. As many of you will know, Professor Wilkinson is a, is a famous uh, figure in this field. He uh, is a professor emeritus of social epidemiology at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Uh, he is perhaps best known to the, to the broader public as the co-author with Kate Pickett uh, of a book called The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better. Um, he's also the co-founder of the Equality Trust, which is a charity that works to reduce economic and social inequality in the UK. Uh, of course, this is an open event, uh, and, and I'm pleased to see many, many people here today, uh, but it also serves as the, as the uh, opening event of a summer school uh, this weekend, which has been co-organized by the Gullivar Sorsa Foundation, uh, the Workers' Educational Association, and the Social Democratic and Youth, uh, youth and Student Organizations. Uh, after the lecture, we will hear a brief comments from uh, Anni Martinen. Anni is the head economist at SOSTE, which is a Finnish umbrella organization of social affairs and health NGOs. At the end, we will have time for uh, questions and answers. And I would like to point out that for those of you who are watching this online, uh, please use the chat function and we will try to pick your questions from there. And of course, if you are here, you will be given a microphone and, uh, and it's the traditional way. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Professor Wilkinson for the lecture. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh... Nice to be with you at least this far. I'm, I'm particularly sorry actually that I, I've decided not to fly uh, for environmental reasons, but I would really love to visit Finland. Um, it's the only Scandinavian country I haven't visited several times. Uh, so I feel it's a great loss, but uh, this is better than nothing. Um, well, I'm going to talk about the effects of inequality uh, income inequality, uh, the size of the gap between rich and poor. Um, okay. Now, what I want to um, say first is just how glad I am that uh, Finland has joined the, uh, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Uh, now with a growing number of, of countries, governments uh, listed there, Canada, Finland, Iceland, New Zealand, Scotland and Wales, who have all decided that they will um, prioritize improvements in well-being over economic growth um, as uh, a major response to uh, the climate crisis. Uh, so I want to start just by saying how delighted I am that fin Finland is one of those countries leading the way uh, to the rest of the world. Next slide. Um, I think most people think of inequality uh, as mattering only if it creates terrible poverty or something like that. Uh, but actually, I think it's important that people should regard and recognize inequality as a social relationship. Um, that, uh, if you like, inequality brings out features of our evolved psychology. It's to do with dominance and subordination, superiority and inferiority. I often say that to understand the effects of inequality on human beings, you have to think more about monkey hierarchies uh, than, for instance, political philosophies like Marxism. Uh, it has really profound effects to do with our uh, evolved psychology. Um, <clears throat> now, on the next slide, uh, you can see here uh, poverty in different countries in rich and poor countries. And you see, they, they, poverty has totally different meanings in a country like India compared to a country like Norway or Finland, for that matter. Um, I want to quote from a study which asked people 
uh, about their experience of poverty in different countries. And although it meant such very different things in physical terms, uh, what they found asking people about their experience of poverty is that it was a, had a great deal of similarity in it. So uh, let me just read from uh, the study a few, uh, a paragraph or so. They said respondents, this is Uganda, India, China, Pakistan, Korea, United Kingdom, and Norway. So they're summarizing from their interviews with poor people in those countries. Respondents universally despised poverty and frequently despised them for being poor. Parents were often despised by their children. Women despised their men folk. And some men were reported to take out their self-loathing on their partners and children. Despite generally believing that they had done their best against all odds, they mostly considered that they had both failed themselves by being poor and that others saw them as failures. This internalization of shame was further externally reinforced in the family, the workplace, and in their dealings with officialdom. Even children couldn't escape this shaming, for with the possible exception of Pakistan, School was an engine of social grading, a place of humiliation for those without the possessions that guaranteed acceptance. So the experience of poverty has enormously to do with uh, being at the bottom of the hierarchy. Don't think of it simply in terms of material circumstances themselves. It's how material circumstances place you in a, in a hierarchy and increase with bigger differences the idea that some people are better than others. That is really um, essential to, to uh, the understanding the effects of inequality. On the next slide, um, you can see what I think we're really dealing with is whether our um, social pyramids in our societies are, are very steep ones, um, like that cone on the, the left, or uh, much shallower one, um, the, the pyramids, steeper or shallower pyramids, according to the amount of inequality. And we can see that uh, the scale of inequality, the height of the social pyramid, the scale of the social differences between classes um, has a huge range of effect. Um, it uh, affects um, all the problems with social gradient, gradients like health and education, which are always worst in the poorest areas. Uh, it increases the residential segregation of rich and poor. Um, it leads to fewer um, marriages of people from different class, social class backgrounds. Um, community life weakens and there is less social mobility in countries with bigger income differences. So think of it as um, basically uh, something, inequality is what increases the importance of class and status. Um, that is, is central to its effects. On the next slide, you can see some of the kind of evidence uh, there is for that uh, little summary I've, if I've just given you. Up the side there, you've got uh, a status anxiety, a measure of how worried people feel about how they're seen and judged by others. Along the bottom, you've got all the different income groups from the poorest on the left to the richest tenth on the right. And what the graph is showing is in more unequal countries, the top line, uh, people are more worried about um, status, there's more status anxiety in all income groups, right across society, compared to the bottom line, which is the more equal countries with lower levels of status anxiety. So, the whole stru social structure becomes more, if you like, ossified. It becomes harder to move up and down um, and uh, we judge each other more by status. On the next slide, you can see another indication of how sensitive we are to social status. 
this is from a, a whole group of experiments um, called social stereotype threat experiments, um, where people, in, in this case, um, children from different Indian castes were given little pen and paper tests to do. Um, and at first, when they did them, uh, there was no difference in performance between uh, the higher and lower caste children. But as soon as they knew who was high low, and low, low caste, when they knew uh, the, the backgrounds, um, a huge gap opens up. And if that's the result of just a little bit of information provided in the experimental situation, how much more powerful would the effects be uh, to children at school who live with that feeling of inferiority uh, all the time. Um, on the next slide, I want to basically show that um, inequality affects health and well-being, it damages democracy, and it makes it less likely that we shall ever reach uh, uh, environmental sustainability. Um, and on the next slide it is uh, just an indication of the effect of inequality uh, on uh, political processes, on uh, democracy, if you like. Not only do uh, the super rich become much more influential in politics, uh, giving large sums of money, basically buying uh, the policies they want from leading politicians, as happens so much in the United States, and I think increasingly in, in Britain. Um, but you also get an increasing political polarization, uh, which this graph shows. This is American data, and you can see as uh, the inequality, the blue line rises, so does that political pol polarization that is so crippling American politics at the moment, uh, uh, to a point where we wonder what, uh, well, it seems to me unlikely that whoever wins the next American election, uh, that the other side will accept that victory. Um, so now let me move on uh, to the next slide. Uh, basically, I'm going to show you a lot of graphs like this. Um, with different problems vertically um, of that vertical axis and income inequality along the bottom. The more unequal societies will always be on the right uh, and you'll see that again and again uh, they do worse. The next slide shows an index of a whole range of health and social problems. We got figures for each of these, uh, and these are the rich, basically the rich market democracies uh, for which uh, when we were doing this work there was good income distribution, internationally comparable income distribution data, uh, i.e. measures of the gap between the rich and poor. So we got figures for each country on life expectancy, on kids maths and literacy scores, infant mortality rates, homicide rates, proportion of the population in prison, teenage birth rates, how much people feel they can trust others, um, and uh, obesity, um, mental illness, um, which in the standard classification of mental illnesses includes drug and alcohol addiction, and some figures on social mobility. They're all scored so that worse outcomes are higher scores. So you see the most unequal, the USA, um, uh, Portugal, UK, all doing worst on that um, index of health and social problems. Whereas uh, the more uh, equal Scandinavian countries and Japan at the bottom left doing, uh, doing better. We were a little bit afraid that people would think we'd um, uh, chosen problems to suit our argument. Um, or somehow tampered with the data. This data is just downloaded from OECD and the World Health Organization and so on. But on the next side, you will see another index, um, an index of uh, child well-being, uh, which we had nothing to do with making up. Uh, it's, it, it contains about 40 different components. On this graph, uh, better scores 
uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, sorry, <laughs> getting in which way round. Um, so lower measures of child well-being are lower scores. So the USA does worst as it did in the last graph. Um, the index contains issues like whether what it, child immunization rates are like, whether they have books at home, whether whether they get bullied at school, all sorts of things like that. Um, go into that index and you see a very impressive relationship with inequality. The more unequal the country, uh, the worse uh, uh, child well-being is. Um, <clears throat> in the next slide, you can see that there are now lots of papers that show basically the same pattern for um, our recent experience of the COVID ep epidemic papers that showed deaths were higher, uh, infection rates were higher in more unequal countries, um, as we find with um, quite a number of, of health outcomes. Um, I'm going to take you through now just a few of the other outcomes um, related to inequality. Uh, so you can see the individual uh, uh, the, the, the data on individual outcomes. The next graph shows imprisonment rates. Uh, you see here um, you've got uh, prisoners per 100,000 population in each country. Um, very big differences. The vertical axis is a log scale uh, and there are at least tenfold differences in the proportion of people locked up uh, in more and less equal countries. Um, that is not only um, a result of uh, more crime, a little of it is more crime, but most of it is more punitive sentencing. Um, if you're sent to, um, if you're found guilty of a crime, you get a much longer sentence in the more unequal countries. On the next slide, uh, you can see uh, that uh, social mobility is lower in more unequal countries. This is an important graph because I think some people think that big income differences don't matter if uh, if it's true that people who work hard move up and ones who don't move down. But what this shows is there's less social movement. The measure of social mobility uh, is the correlation between parents and children's income. So it's really asking, do rich parents have rich children uh, and poor parents have poor children or doesn't parental income matter very much? And what it shows is that the bigger the income difference is, the more par parental income determines what happens to their children. Um, so again, as I said, the social structure becomes more ossified. Um, uh, on the next slide, um, this is uh, some recent work um, showing differences in uh, whether lost property is returned. Experiments in which wallets are left around and they, uh, in these experiments, look to see what proportion are returned. And you see in the more unequal countries on the right, only perhaps 20% of the wallets that are found are returned. Whereas again, in the more equal countries, top left, um, you can see that perhaps 80% of them are returned. So big differences in that sort of, I think the authors of the paper call it civic honesty. Uh, and uh, uh, lastly, um, on the next slide, you can see uh, the idea that um, we need inequality because it drives creativity and initiative and effort uh, seems not to be true. Uh, this is um, a, a, from a paper which looked at uh, patents per head of population. So it looks at, uh, if you like, patents as a measure of inventiveness. Um, and you can see that patents per head of population um, are much higher 
in the more equal countries at the top left. So uh, the evidence suggests that uh, those more unequal countries are less creative, less imaginative, less innovative. Uh, the next slide shows the range of outcomes we've looked at. I can't take you through all of them, but all these things listed there are um, shown. Uh, we, we have found are, uh, are related to um, inequality. They're all problems that have uh, social gradients, i.e. worse outcomes in the poor areas. You know, you all know in, I'm sure in, in Helsinki, uh, that health is worst, life expectancy shortest, um, and uh, educational measures are less good in in the poorest areas of, of Helsinki, as in cities everywhere. Um, uh, you see the health, the human capital, and the social relations measures um, that we've been through, all related to inequality. So. Can we move to the, the next slide? Um, yes, I want you to take you through what I think is the most uh, central, fundamental, and perhaps important effect of inequality. Its effect on the quality of social relations um, in, in the public sphere. This is about uh, um, whether people are involved in community life. It uses measures of uh, whether people belong to associations, voluntary groups, and so on in their locality. And you see in a number of papers show this same pattern that uh, where there's more inequality, uh, community life, social cohesion atrophies, um, uh, it gets weaker. Uh, and on the next slide, you can see the same thing. Uh, for trust. People trust each other less. Indeed, if if you've got to walk home late at night in a, a big city, you'd feel much safer doing it in, in a more equal countries, country. You'd have to be less aware of who else was on the street around you. Um, uh, you'd feel safer walking home alone, uh, even late at night. The next slide uh, shows that you know, once you've lost that uh, community life, that sense of trust, that, um, uh, if you like, um, uh, what's the word I want, um, reciprocity and so on, public spiritedness, uh, as inequality reduces all that, uh, you not only get lack of trust, um, and as I showed in the, the slide on lost, lost wallets, uh, people uh, being less cooperative and helpful, but here uh, you see that homicide rates are higher in more unequal societies. These dots are American states, the red dots, the uh, blue ones are Canadian provinces, uh, by the way, all this work I've been showing you, we've done not only in the rich countries, but also on the American states to check that we find the same uh, picture uh, of the importance of inequality in both settings. Um, there are dozens of papers uh, looking at homicide rates around the world that show this uh, uh, relationship with inequality. Um, and if you look at really much more unequal countries than I have in, uh, included in the data, countries like um, Mexico or South Africa, you'll see a picture like the next slide shows. Um, this is uh, Mexico where we were giving some lectures and you see there people are actually frightened of each other. Um, there are bars on the windows and doors, razor wire on the fences and so on. And it's not just one or two houses, it's whole streets of houses where people show that basically uh, people are afraid of each other. And in South Africa, on the next slide, um, you see the same pattern. Um, those horizontal wires at the top are, of course, an electric fence. And the notice 
basically tells you that uh, you may get shot if you're caught climbing in. What I think is, is uh, really remarkable is that picture I've given you in the last few slides of uh, the deterioration of uh, community life and social relationships to the point where people do fear each other is also shown in quite different data. On the next slide, you can see uh, the work of two American economists, Bose and Jayadev, and again, they did it for American states and for uh, these rich developed countries. Uh, and what they're showing is that uh, the proportion of the population uh, working in jobs that they classify as guard labor, that is security staff and police and prison officers and so on, all, basically all the people we use to protect ourselves from each other um, increases with inequality. Um, so showing that same awful pattern of the loss of good social relationships, public spirited trust, reciprocity, and its replacement by fear. Um, what is so tragic about that is that if you look at the studies of the determinants of happiness and well-being, uh, they show again and again that crucially important is the quality of social relations. How many friends you have, the quality of your uh, relationships with people, whether you're involved in community life. And so the effect of inequality goes to the heart of the de determinants of well-being. Um, I want now to move on to what we see in uh, effects on, on mental health. On the next slide, um, I've uh, referenced a paper which deals with what psychologists call the dominance behavioral system. Uh, the areas of our brain specialized in dealing with these issues to do with a hierarchy, dominance, subordination, superiority and inferiority. And they found in this paper uh, Sherry Johnson and her colleagues at Berkeley in, in California, that um, uh, a range of mental illnesses and personality disorders are triggered or exacerbated um, by more mental illness, by, by um, social hierarchy issues to do with dominance and subordination. And on the next slide, you see the result of that. Uh, this is from the British Medical Journal. Uh, those blue lines are the strength of the correlation uh, internationally between uh, those mental illnesses and disorders on the left, listed on the left, and inequality. So the longer the line, uh, the more strongly these conditions are correlated with inequality, more common in the more unequal societies. Um, and what we find, as the next slide shows, is uh, that uh, basically the two um, obvious, most obvious responses, you either feel uh, you're not good enough, uh, feelings of inferiority, um, inadequacy, uh, that you're not attractive enough and so on. Uh, you uh, social contact too stressful. Or you have the opposite uh, response. On the next slide, um, you see that um, uh, you, if you're worried about how you're seen and judged, instead of withdrawing from social life, you might try and show what a great person you are and how brilliant you are. Uh, you might become very narcissistic. And we find both those responses more common in more unequal societies. As the next slide shows, depression increases uh, with uh, greater inequality. Now, several studies showing that. Uh, and on the next slide still, um, you can see that what psychologists call self-enhancement, that tendency to big yourself up, uh, present yourself as um, clever, attractive, um, more capable than others increases in, in those more unequal countries. Um, on the next slide, you can see uh, 
one of the other obvious effects of de the desire to big yourself up, to look good in front of other people, uh, is the way it feeds into consumerism, buying uh, uh, status goods. For instance, uh, studies have shown that if you live in a more unequal area, you're more likely to spend money on a, a flashy car, on an expensive car, um, but also uh, you are more likely to buy clothes with designer labels and all the rest of it. So it foods, feeds directly into consumerism. Um, uh, and the next slide shows how uh, advertisers know that so well and are always playing on these uh, insecurities, uh, using it to sell goods. Um, of course, consumerism that is intensified, as I've just suggested, by inequality um, makes it harder to reach sustainability. Uh, the next slide, um, uh, the, the difficulty of reaching sustainable well-being is increased by inequality in a number of different ways, um, not only because uh, uh, Consumerism is, is one of the big um, uh, obstacles, um, but also because it needs a sense of public spiritedness. Um, uh, interestingly, in Britain in the war, uh, the government wanted people to feel that the burden of war was equally shared. They wanted people to participate in the war effort. And to do that, they decided they had to reduce inequality. Um, so they uh, introduced rat food rationing. They uh, uh, put taxes on luxuries and subsidies on necessities. Income distribution got uh, differences got narrower. Um, uh, income tax got more progressive. And by making our society more equal, they gained that sense uh, of being all in it together um, and cooperating in the war effort. And of course, that's what we need if we're to move towards sustainability, uh, particularly given that the um, biggest environmental footprints are those of the rich. So as the Gilets Jaunes in, in France showed, uh, the less well off are not going to accept green taxes and so on, um, increased fuel prices. Uh, um, uh, if if uh, the problem, if they see it as unfair, um, those demonstrations in France went on for months and months in cities all over France until uh, the extra fuel tax, which uh, President Macron introduced as a green measure, as an environmental measure, uh, they went on uh, until they were withdrawn. So uh, our approach to dealing with uh, uh, consumption and uh, um, making the transition to sustainability has to be seen and felt as an egalitarian measure. Um, we can also see, um, skip the next slide, so jump to please, jump. That's it. Uh, there are surveys of business leaders internationally, which show that business leaders in more equal countries uh, regard um, environmental um, issues, uh, agreements as more important than they do in the more unequal countries. Um, I think in the more unequal countries, probably business leaders just decide that uh, um, issues to do with uh, uh, sustainability are up to the government, not their business, whereas there's a much wider sense of public participation uh, in this problem in the more equal countries at the top left there. Um, you can also see on the next slide that people bicycle more, they ride bicycles more in, in, in more equal countries. Um, and it goes on, and uh, there are lots of outcomes that that show that we're, the more equal countries are in a better place. Um, what can be done on the next slide? Um, uh, we can redistribute income through taxes and benefits. 
<clears throat> we have to end the tax havens and the scale of tax avoidance and so on. Um, uh, but we also have to reduce the scale of income differences before taxes. Um, and uh, I think there are a number of different ways of doing that. Uh, the next slide shows uh, what's been happening to income inequality um, in uh, uh, Finland. Um, this is uh, an index of disposable income, uh, i.e. after taxes and benefits. Um, and you see uh, those um, ups and downs, but uh, a small rise over that period. Um, a, a lot of uh, the income differences are much bigger, of course, before taxes and benefits. Um, I have a slide showing that's the next one, but I think I should skip that and go straight on. Um, thank you. Uh, to show the general pattern of inequality over the 20th century, there's that long decline in inequality from somewhere in, after the First World War. Uh, continuing through uh, to the uh, late 1970s and uh, then from 1980, the modern rise of inequality. That, I think, has to be seen as a change in ideology, the neoliberal ideology replacing uh, the ideology to do with uh, social democracy, socialism, uh, the power of trade unions. Uh, on the next slide, You'll see part of the reason why I say that. Um, that top line is income inequality in the United States. It's the share of society's income going to the richest 10%. But the blue line, which looks like a mirror image of it, is the proportion of the population in trade unions. Uh, so uh, I think that is not because trade unions transform people's wages. I think it, they're important. Uh, but because they act as a, uh, an indication of the strength of the labor movement, of the social, of social democratic parties, and of the, the view that there is another better way that society can work. And when that disappears uh, with uh, free market fundamentalism, neoliberalism, with Thatcher and Reagan uh, from around 1980, um, we get the widening. We got legislation, of course, to weaken trade unions. Then uh, we get the lowering of top tax rates and, and many other changes that contributed to that widening. So it's important to recognize, uh, and this is now, I think, fairly widely agreed, that income distribution is a political matter. Um, Thomas Piketty uh, makes that point in his uh, new book, and so do uh, several others we've uh, seen recently. Um, two more slides and I'm finished. Um, uh, the next one uh, shows how income differences within companies have widened uh, dramatically. You see in uh, the 1970s, the difference between the uh, CEOs pay at the top and uh, the average production worker, uh, the CEO got sort of 20 or 30 times as much as the average production worker. But by the first uh, decade this century, um, they're getting two or three hundred times as much as the average production worker. And that had for um, uh, uh, company performance. It's been shown in a number of studies uh, and those huge uh, incomes at the top seem unrelated to measures of performance of companies. Um, so we have to deal with that. I think that we're not going to be able to uh, necessarily uh, rebuild the trade union movement to the strength it had because uh, the heavy industries have uh, declined and we now have much smaller uh, service uh, companies um, where it's harder to unionize. Uh, so I think we need to move towards forms of economic democracy. Um, let's have my next slide, my last slide. Um, economic democracy, of course, reduces the scale of pay differences in companies. 
you might think your boss should have twice as much as you, or, or maybe even five times as not, not much, but not hundreds of times as much. Um, so uh, employee representatives on the company board uh, improves uh, uh, those, uh, reduces those pay differentials. It also, I think, when you get strong employee representation, uh, improves the experience of work. Um, in uh, studies of what are the best workplaces, um, often end up by saying that the more cooperative companies uh, are the best work environments. They also redistribute uh, uh, wealth because uh, instead of uh, company, the, the productive assets being owned by the rich, um, uh, in, in employee owned companies, they're owned by the body of employees. Studies, including some coming out of Harvard Business School, show that um, uh, more democratic companies improve uh, productivity um, and makes companies more environmentally uh, and socially responsible. So I think to bed greater equality more fundamentally into our societies, we must extend democracy uh, into the um, economy. Um, you know, the way the um, old communist countries used to try and do it, it was by diktat with the costs to freedom of speech and, other, and the need to build a police state and all that awfulness. Um, but we must uh, increase democracy the opposite way, by extending democracy rather than restricting it. Um, and our political democracies, I think, uh, often in, seem increasingly meaningless, but I think we can uh, rescue them by extending an econ democracy into new spheres. So let me leave it li like that. Thank you for listening and for giving me this time. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, I think before uh, Anne Martinez's comment, we have time for a couple of questions for you. So, do we have any uh, comments on chat? No. Okay, how about here, uh, here by the audience in Musikitalo? <laughs> So, I was thinking about what you said about the British war effort and and we have been having uh, for last, last last few years and, and, and this year especially there there have been many like outside shocks uh, the coronavirus and now the uh, increasing the violent war in Ukraine. So, uh, what's the role of, of these kind of outside events and, and like common crises uh, in l creating the political moment or like political uh, uh, will for decrease in, in uh, inequality? Well, I think there's no doubt that inequality makes the world a more dangerous place, as I showed in one of those later slides. Uh, these trends have been very widespread, not just one or two countries, but that general tendency to have rising inequality since the 19, uh, since about 1980. Um, and uh, I, I think that, well, there are papers which show it has contributed to uh, the right-wing populism. Um, a study actually from uh, people in, in Germany and France of the areas that had, the small neighborhoods that had voted most strongly uh, for right-wing populist candidates. They interviewed people from door to door in those areas to find out what the common element was. And they found that it was people uh, uh, feeling, uh, made to feel inferior and uh, so on. Um, so I think there's a very direct relationship. But also, of course, the world becomes a more dangerous place with um, 
uh, the effects of climate change, which were feeling uh, much more strongly than had been predicted uh, just a few years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, when you see that temperatures have been up to 50 centigrade in, for days in India, uh, those are really unlivable temperatures. And of course, there have been huge droughts in part of the world, harvest failures. There will be increasing uh, movements of refugees. So I think the, there are numerous consequences of inequality, including, I suspect, that the, the, the kind of strongman dictatorship we've seen well, Trump in the United States and Putin in Russia, but also Bolsonaro in, in uh, Brazil. Um, those people are more dangerous and they are more likely to get elected um, in unequal societies. Our own Boris Johnson is another awful example um, who, who's brought the state of our politics to a, a, an abysmally low level of lying um, and corruption. Um, so I think that's the connection. Uh, hello, Richard. My name is Peter. I'm a psychological science and I had looked into the future of food production for the past three years. I have a question though, because I think, um, I must admit that I think your message is a bit uh, negative. Um, the sources I have point in a slightly different direction. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I ask you please to comment. So, for example, in 2018, so Stuart and Gary uh, published a uh, paper called uh, Gender Paradox or something. Well, they show that in inequality uh, in the job market and, and when it comes to education is very low in... Um, <clears throat> in the democratic part of the world and that they that they went on to discuss why women in democratic countries avoid stem education and stem uh, works and that's science technology engineering and math so second steve pinker harvard another psychologist in his um, better angels of our nature in 2011 and enlightenment now the case for science, hum humanity and reason, I think it is, show that um, violence, for example, has decreased significantly for the past uh, 600 years and, and accelerated, I think, from the 1980s. And also that all these uh, negative trends we often think about has moved in the opposite direction. So, for example, global poverty uh, is lower than ever. More kids than ever celebrate their fifth birthday and so on. And second, uh, you were talking about climate stuff. Uh, but data from NASA show that India and China has become significantly Green, greener for the past 20 years. So for me, this is not, this is a pattern, of course. I'm considered the positive guy, so. Uh, but what's your take on, on, on those claims? I don't say it's absolutely true, but it's pointing in a different direction compared to your, what, to, to your message. Yes, of course, the, the world has uh, improved in living standards uh, over the last uh, century. I never suggested uh, inequality was the only influence on these outcomes. And educational performance is influenced by all sorts of school variables and uh, class sizes and numbers of teachers and, and so on. Um, and we've drawn attention to some of those other uh, components. Um, uh, with violence, um, again, uh, there have been historical uh, declines in violence, um, I'm very glad to say, but uh, inequality is still a powerful influence. Um, there are, uh, 
about 10 years ago, uh, we estimated that there were 60, 60 papers showing that relationship between inequality and violence, uh, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally. Uh, what the evidence you have uh, pointed out, uh, and perhaps I should have uh, found time to include it, uh, is not contradictory at all of what I've been saying about the importance and power of inequality. Um, we have done two review studies. Um, the first in, when was it? Uh, I can't remember the year, but uh, I think in social science and medicine, um, as were epidemiologists, uh, showing uh, results from 170 papers looking at inequality in relation to health variables. Then we did another paper in um, the European Journal of uh, Social Psychology looking at the claim that these uh, relationships were causal uh, and again reviewing a very large number of papers there. So it's not one or the other, it's both. Um, any, and what is upsetting is actually the background rate of improvement in so many things has ceased uh, in several countries. United States, after well over a hundred years of improving life expectancy, has had falling life expectancy recently. Um, and Britain looks as if it's on the same trend uh, much more recently. Um, so uh, I think there was a background rate of improvement in health that was the biggest unexplained mystery in public health, my field. Um, and uh, it takes very rapid, large increases in inequality to actually reverse that. But that seems to have happened in a few countries. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll take one comment uh, more for this and, and uh, Richard can answer and then we'll have Anni Martinez comment and afterwards we'll take more questions from the audience. I'd like to question a little bit about this gender equality thing because I've noticed that the progress for female representation in parliaments is pretty slow even though uh, we are talking about 100 years. It's remarkably slow and it's still like uh, something between 20 and 30 percent, uh, this female representation. And also uh, I'd, like, I'd like to ask what you think about this uh, CG G, uh, goals of UN, United Nations, which states that uh, schools in poorer countries should take more responsibility of dropout girls, those girls who have left school. So what do you think? Is it like local res of, uh, responsibility of local uh, schools or should international organizations take greater responsibility in this? Well, of course, it's not one or the other, it's both. <laughs> uh, there have been several studies, and I, I, <laughs> I can't have an infinitely wide range of outcomes and causes, uh, but there have been a number of studies looking at both uh, ethnic inequality and gender inequalities that suggests that uh, there are worse, in, again, in more unequal studies. There was one in the States that looked at a number of different um, measures of women's position, uh, their political participation in terms of the proportion of representatives who were women, their pay disadvantage, uh, and uh, the, um, I think the proportion of women in, in uh, uh, some um, occupations. And uh, they all looked better in more equal uh, societies, as you'd expect. Um, of course, the position of uh, women was regarded as important uh, in developing countries in relation to infant mortality. Uh, for a long time, the people noted that infant mortality rates were lower um, and where women were better educated. 
and assumed that uh, better educated women were, I don't know, more sensible or more knowledgeable about uh, 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 caring for their children. Um, but then it became clear that in those same countries where women were better educated, men's mortality was better and women's also. Um, so everyone benefits. Um, uh, and it looks to me as if what was happening is that in more, uh, in those countries where women's status was better, it was better because the public space was more sociable. Um, uh, if you like, the, there was better social cohesion in those societies. So women no longer have to be, uh, if you like, chaperoned by the men because the public space is, is dangerous. M m violence counts for less. Um, and uh, in those kinds of more sociable societies, uh, we all benefit. Um, uh, as I said, shown in uh, women's mortality, uh, infant mortality, and male mortality. Uh, thank you. Uh, now uh, it's time for Anni Martinen's comment. Anni is a chief uh, economist uh, in SOSTE, which is a Finnish Federation for Social Affairs and Health. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Kalevi Sarsasatya, for having me here today comment on this, this presentation. It's a very important topic for me personally and for on behalf of my occupation as a chief economist at SOSTE, which is the rooftop organization for all the social and health organizations in Finland. I previously worked at ASACO, which is the trade union confederation in Finland, so these, these issues are very important to me as well and it's very nice to be here i haven't i don't remember when i've seen people live or <laughs> spoken to people live i'm so used to seeing people to the screen of my computer but um i wasn't able to catch the whole presentation unfortunately but some of it and um, i wanted to come here and comment on my perspective on well-being economy which is um a phenom phenomenon and um, an idea um, and a theory that we're pushing through in Finland with SOSTE and um, Social and Healthcare Ministry and also on the EU level. And what, when we talk about well-being economy, um, in our perspective, it's a new way of thinking economy and our society. We cannot go on further in our future and in our societies without thinking in every single aspect of policy, economy, um, the well-being of people. The people are our resources. And I know it's, uh, very, it's not very humane to talk about people as resources, and I, I'd rather not, but that's the system that we live in. And in order to have impact on the system, we need to speak about people and our people and our well-being with the words that is given to us. So people are, are the things that make our society. And well-being economy, it's a new way, it's an answer to things such as neoliberalism that has been one of the causes for inequality and increasing inequality and disruption of trade unions, as Professor Wilkinson just mentioned in his presentation. Um, we had the financial crisis in 2008, and I think many of us noticed that the neoliberalism and and free markets without any, any help from the government or thinking the new ways of economy, it's not how we can go on with our future. Thinking about social and healthcare, well-being um, and climate change. We have had models in macroeconomics. I'm a macroeconomist. Um, I started my studies in 2011 and that was three years after the financial crisis. And my studies showed all the models that had gone wrong and caused us the financial crisis, and that's why I'm here today. Um, well-being well economy, there are many different theories, such as well-being economy, donut economics, um, feminist economics. And in my, my view, I think well-being economy is one of the main goals that we want to achieve. We want to achieve a system and processes in economic policy that 
um, pro produces thus a system where we can put ecological and sociological um, aspects first. Instead of constantly thinking about growth, GDP growth, or our um, system ba systemic balance of, of, of public finances. Those are, of course, important, but those cannot be the first priority. We need to think about our people and our climate, because without people and climate, we have nothing. We don't have an economic system. Um, I wanted to pinpoint also the fact that when we talk about equality, it's now more important than ever. We've just had corona crisis. I think my mic is yes, and uh, now we have the war in Ukraine, which are in uh, incredible um, humanitarian crisis, and it shows us that we have the system when we have a when we have a crisis that affects both people and economy. That we tend to still, up to this day, prioritize the economy. We are worried about the GDP growth, inflation, but when we talk about the policy, do we actually? This is something to think about. Do we actually put the people? in front. Now that we think about what to do with the inflation, do we remember the people that don't have money to buy food? Um, do we remember the people who are suffering the most? Or are we more um, pinpointed or are reminded that the fact that we need to stabilize the economy? There's no economy without the people. Um, in the Ukrainian war, we also t tend to think about people as an aggregate people, but we tend to forget that we have different uh, minorities. We have BIPOC people, we have women, um, disabled, and these crises are affected differently to all of us. And it's very, it's horrible to see what's happening in, in Ukraine, uh, that the disabled people are forgotten in their homes and they are forced to stay in the area. And then we have people who are able to walk, they can flee the country and seek safety. Um, so, in my opinion, it's a systemic change and I am very much the advocate for changing economic policy for, in a way, to have the means and processes to um, make uh, affection calculations and everything to put the healthcare and social investments in the heart of our economic policy, and we do have means for that. We talk about, we talk about phenomena-based um, budgeting, for example. In our government, we have in Finland, there has been a um, like a line saying that we are focused in gender-based budgeting, childcare budgeting, but where do we actually see it? Um, in Finland, it has been um, very, very superficial. Um, there are means to means to actually make economic policy, um, to have the effects calculated on every single budget de decision. How does it affect disabled people? For example, when we invest in pavements, in streets or, or accessibility, we always should remember how it affects every single people, if it's equal or if it's not. And if it's not, should we do it? And, um, and also remember in the crisis scenario we have in Finland, the trans law, has been on the tra table for for many years, and now that we have the crisis, the crisis tends to over uh, sort of leave these type of soft policies that are usually the equality policies behind and in the shadow, um, which is not something that we we want. So, um, on my last notes, um, there there are things to do in Finland. We have. Um, our inequalities on income have decreased, um, but we see that the level of income has not increased for the 90% in Finland. But the 1%, the richest 1%, their wealth has increased remarkably in the past few decades. And this is um, something to think about in the tax policy that in the 90s they divided the wealth or capital income and labor income and we have our labor income is more progressive and when now the the sort of um, the linearities are skewed in a way that when we have the wealthiest one percent whose income is growing because their majority of income is capital and they don't have a progressive income tax 
So this is something to think, think about and we have the elections next year and I'm happy to see that people are actually actually thinking about this this kind of policy to to make our income more more equal. And also um, we are very proud of our healthcare system. Um, Bernie Sanders uh, tweeted some time ago that uh, they would want the same system as in Finland. But <laughs> we are very we're very proud of that. But when we actually compare Finnish and EU level healthcare systems, less than 50% of Finnish people actually can get the treatment in our system. So there it is flawed. It is the lines um, for healthcare are tremendous. And this is something, if we want to have, we always talk about productivity. We want growth, we want productivity, but we don't take care of our people. So this is something, it's very, it's, there's a contradiction in this. So I, in my view, if we can take all the people who need care, who need mental treatment or anything, they need to have the treatment in order to work. And this is, this is the welfare state idea, but it's not, we're actually, we're not delivering our, our promises. Also, education is something that we're very proud of, and for, for a reason, for a good reason. But it, there are also things that um, hinder the, the development that we could have. We, we say in Finland that it's now more common that doctors' children become doctors. And the poverty and the lack of capabilities that we have for children who come from poorer families, they don't believe in the future, they don't trust that they can actually have the education or the trust in the future that they can actually step from one one um, class to another. We, we, we shouldn't talk about classes anymore, but we still have working classes. So there are things that we can improve and this is something to think about and I'm very much looking forward to your comments and, and to asking, answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anni. Uh, would you, Richard, want to comment on that, for example, about the theory or politics of, of a well-being economy? Well, I, I think the aim is uh, exactly right, uh, but I think that um, uh, we're going to find it much harder, not only because we've left it so late uh, to take serious action moving towards sustainability, but because the scale of the changes uh, involves uh, what will look like more economic growth. Um, I mean, suddenly changing our whole power supply and the uh, electrical grid system uh, to renewables <coughs> um, is a huge undertaking and it will mean vast quantities of cement and so on, but also depending on batteries uh, the materials for batteries. Um, there, are, there are so many major problems that uh, William Rees, the man who uh, invented the concept of the uh, global, uh, of the um, environmental footprint, uh, has suggested that the scale of these problems of conversion um, are almost insurmountable. It, it's a it's an extremely worrying picture, but we have to uh, aim, um, as Annie said, for um, to combine uh, well-being with low growth uh, or no growth. Um, I just don't know whether that is consistent with the scale and speed of the conversion we have to make. Thank you. Then we'll move on to questions from the audience. And I think we have one, one, uh, two questions for, for, from the chat. Uh, All right. Uh, first question. Do you have an opinion on how to proceed with the democratization of businesses? Should this be left to businesses themselves to decide or enforce this through law by making all businesses democratic, for example? Well, uh, uh, about half the member countries of the European Union have some legislation for employee representation. Mostly it's only take token, but in countries like Germany, it's um, much more powerful. And so in, in companies, I think with more than 2000 employees, 
half the people on the remuneration committee deciding pay have to be employee representatives. Um, and I do think that uh, explains partly why the income differences have grown more slowly than in, in uh, countries like Britain and the United States, where we don't have any representation, any legislation of that kind. Uh, in uh, uh, the Prime Minister before uh, last, Theresa May, in, in Britain, when she was campaigning for the leadership, she said she would introduce legislation of that kind. She didn't. Uh, but I think it has to be through legislation. I think that uh, uh, CEOs often feel threatened by, by democracy. They regard it as something that gets in their way uh, and perhaps uh, also worry about it reducing their, their astronomical pay levels. Um, so I do think legislation is the way. But all, sorry, not just legislation, but also incentives to employee ownership and cooperation and cooperatives and so on. Um, uh, thanks. There's a second question. If it's okay, uh, just a quick comment. Um, I, I couldn't agree more um, with um, Professor Wilkinson on this. Um, there's also um, sort of a balance between coming into the or pushing the legislation on on companies and um, with increasing the incentives. And I think there's like a golden lane going with this as well. But we can see we we can see the democratization in a way that that young zillennials are actually. They want to see the change in the same values with their with the products that they, that they buy, and it's a force that comes with the young generation. That we cannot have companies that are exploiting workers or exploiting nature. Um, it's you you left the train, or the train has already gone if you don't realize this by now. Yes. All right. So the second question. You showed that inequality relates to consumerism, emotional stress, self promotion, etc. Even in our Nordic societies, young people in particular are involved involved in intense consumerism and race for race for exclusive clothes, etc. How would you see that this trend could be tackled or how to cultivate greater equality among young people? I think we need a fundamental change and I do hope that uh, the increasing recognition that uh, inequality is uh, an obstacle to sustainability, uh, increasing recognition in environmental groups. So they are uh, including that in their party programs and so on. Um, I, I think that is uh, key. Um, Sorry, I'm I'm losing the thread. Can you just rem <laughs> remind me of your question? Uh, the trend of consumerism, how could it be tackled and how to cultivate greater equality yeah. among young people? Yes, I think that um, there is already a much bigger support for greater equality amongst young people. It's people my age who are the problem in one country after another. Uh, with uh, quite different uh, values. Um, it's they who voted for Trump, it's they who voted for uh, Boris Johnson in Britain. Um, I, I think in a way there's almost a pent-up demand for our societies to start making progress again. I grew up in a world where I thought that progress was built into the passage of time. Certainly, I, I thought it was part of economic growth. Uh, and then from the 19, late 1970s on, I felt somehow it had stopped. Um, but I saw the liberalization of our societies. And I, I think there is a huge demand for uh, Values that we all intuit are better, more progressive, more moral, more inclusive um, amongst younger people. But we will go on trying to find our show our superiority um, through consumer goods and endless other ways uh, if um, 
inequality of income and wealth makes class and status so powerful. Um, and that's really what happens. Uh, and in, in Sweden in the 1930s, where you get a social democratic election victory, and they stay in power for decades, <clears throat> the Prime Minister then realized that uh, to create a classless society, you have to reduce those income differences. In Britain, we've had prime ministers winning elections and saying on the steps of Downing Street that they want to make a classless society uh, as if they had no idea that it, that was anything to do with the scale of material differences, income and wealth. Um, so we have to tackle that as a central pillar uh, preventing progress. Okay, now we have uh, many hands up here. Let's see that. Hi. Um, so in your presentation, there was a slide in which you grouped the um, societal uh, issues that are correlated with uh, income inequality. And you emphasize the fact that suicide rates alone don't follow the index, but that's not mentioned further. So I would really like to know um, why it was emphasized that suicide alone don't follow the uh, continuum. Yes, thank you. Um, we were at first surprised by that and we spend a, a page or two on uh, in our um, spirit level book uh, talking about that. Um, I'm fairly clear now that I understand it. Um, if you like, you can think of suicide and homicide uh, as two different responses to sometimes similar events. I mean, if your partner leaves you for somebody else or you, you're sacked from your job, you lose your job, do you blame it on other people, um, on your boss, or do you blame it on yourself? Do you blame it on uh, your partner or whoever they've gone off with, or do you blame it on yourself? Um, and it does look as if there is a tendency for suicides and homicides in some data sets to move inversely, that there is some truth in the, um, the, the cliche that violence either goes out among, against other people or in against yourself, uh, depending on whether you blame yourself or blame others. Uh, and so I, I suspect that although uh, depression is more common in more unequal societies, uh, several studies showing that, that uh, that is the explanation why suicides don't have that pattern and are actually more common in the more unequal societies. Thank you. I think this uh, question is more to Anni because this is from uh, Finland's perspective. You were talking about class, which I think that is a uh, very useful uh, concept still, still to talk about our Finnish society. I was wondering because in Finland we talk a lot about equality and we're really proud of our equal society. Does the talk around equality hide the fact that there is still the class process under it and would it uh, make any change if we like noticed the fact that we have still classes and we should talk about it not only the equality and what should we do for that thank you for the excellent question um I think for sure there is something that we're in Finland we're very proud of our uh, the process of equality and how because we are we have a process and we've improved a lot and um, compared to in an international scale we're one of the best performers we're the happiest country in the world uh, but that doesn't mean that we still have a long way to go to actually achieve the 100% equality. I don't know if that's ever, ever will be achieved, but the discussion is very, very important. And a, and a few weeks back, I was 
in Berlin in this seminar for progressive economic studies and we talked about the classes that we have actually now see more than ever after Corona crisis. We have the people, the nurses, um, teachers, kindergarten teachers who took the biggest hits in this crisis and how are they thanked? We're in a major <laughs> war, I could say, with, with the nurses' salary and we still don't see any any thanks or the improvement in that and that is that it's the elite saying that we don't um, we don't actually appreciate your jobs as much. So I think that's a very good point and something that we don't want to admit, but we still have we still have classes and now more than ever we, we we see them and something that we should talk about. Can I just add that I heard in the question, perhaps wrongly, uh, an idea that the income differences and the class differences were more separate than they are. Um, the social distances between classes get bigger with bigger material differences. The rich, uh, the richer they are, the more they can live differently from the rest of us, uh, and the further the poor can fall. Um, so. Uh, we also feel keener to maintain our position and show our status and more worried about how we're judged. Uh, so the, the connections are tight. Uh, thank you. We still have time for at least one or two questions. Uh, uh, Annie, it's your uh, presentation. You, you mentioned a lot of stuff and crisis stuff of Finland. Um, I've been in contact with uh, several politicians and decision makers, and they talk about um, the mental health crisis, but also Folkhälsan Research Center in, in the fall 2020. They sent an alarm uh, and had a seminar about um, the obesity crisis among kids. So my question is, is that explained by inequality or is it explained by diet, dietary advice or anything like that? I tried to make it open. And a couple of weeks ago I attended a peace conference and uh, one of the participants was actually a high-ranking officer at the Minister of Education. And she said, have you heard about the PISA result? Because you mentioned something about that. Uh, yes, everyone said yes, it's false, she said. And I know something about that, so I was a bit surprised. And she said, Finland uh, has a big issues with children's numeracy and reading comprehension. And I had a conversation with her afterwards because I was really surprised. and. Adding to that, you, you said that Finland is the happiest country on the planet. They don't measure happiness. They, they measure life, um, uh, what do you say, um, the acceptance of your, uh, not, not a bit, but just life acceptancy or something like that. I forgot the exact word. But I also contacted the, the, the main um, researcher because they didn't control for the two cultures living in Finland and in previous studies like the North Karela project versus Obo, for example, it showed that the Swedish speaking community had better heart health compared to the Finnish speaking community in the North Karelia. So this, this is more like, uh, can you comment on that? Like this, this is like throwing, throwing out the question um, from a broader perspective, contextualize. What, what's your what's your reaction, in a broader sense? Thank you for the the questions. I, I try to answer as as well as I can. I think you're more more familiar with these topics than I am as an economist. Um, but for for the mental health crisis in Finland, that is indeed true and which I am personally worried about is the fact that that is also one of the main causes for our absence in work um, in Finland. And we have 
the terapia taco, which is the guarantee for therapy that now fell through. Um, so these things that <laughs> are we are we the happiest country? I don't know, and exactly how you how you measure that? It doesn't measure happiness, but certain indices in what you would expect a good life is, and that we measure well. Apparently, um, we could. There are um, our healthcare uh, bureau has calculated some some uh, estimations for how much we could actually save in in our public finance since that's about 11 billion euros if we would we could tackle the mental health crisis that's how many people are absent in work and how much it causes our economy as well and to me it's it's peculiar how less how, how little we care about this because it is a crisis and that's that's something else and with the childhood um, obesity and also with the heart heart issue issues in in Finnish Finnish uh, people compared to Swedish that's something that I uh, I can only speculate where that comes from because I'm not a doctor <laughs> I'm an economist um, but um, for sure I mean there are theories that people who are more obese it, it, it's, it is a reaction or are caused by poverty. So people who are poor or, or lower middle class tend to tend to be more obese because it's the actually the healthier food is more expensive. And yeah, I think that's that's how, how much I can comment on this. Thank you. Can I can I add uh, just to say that again like your previous question, it's it's not one thing or the other. It's usually all these things. Um, and uh, I, I think that one of the things I've missed out actually, which is really so powerful, is the loss of a sense of community. Uh, in my childhood, most people had lived in the town or area they lived in all their lives. I remember looking at the electoral register and seeing 40 people in the same village with the same surname. Um, and all that sense of community has gone with geographic mobility, which may, means we are much more exposed to social comparisons, problems of identity, how we're seen and judged. And our, our, our sense of our own identity is not held in a community with other people who reflect it back to us. Um, and I think those are uh, really powerful background factors to the problems of mental illness we're having everywhere, to our exposure, much greater exposure to the worries about inequality that I've mentioned. Um, so, you know, it, Oh. Well, I'll leave it like that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, time is up and uh, we have to uh, end this discussion here here now, but uh, we are going to continue discussions definitely in the in the uh, during the weekend and at the summer school. So thank you very much, uh, Richard Wilkinson and Annie Martinen for your for your uh, presentation. Thank you.